it's a, a, a real privilege to uh, spend an evening with a group of uh, experts in, in sleep, in sleep science, the history of sleep, and, and, uh, and the, uh, the opera of sleep, as you'll discover later on. There will then have be three breakout rooms. One, the Chaucer room, where you'll hear, be able to hear some of the British Library's collection of sleep sounds. The Bronte room, they will be uh, taking you through the answers and the explanations uh, to the sleep quiz. Um, but you needn't keep your questions just to the sleep quiz. They know everything about sleep, so ask them everything about sleep. Uh, and in the Elliot room, uh, there will be uh, my friend and colleague Chiara Ambrosio, who will take you through um, some of the historical representations of sleep in art, some of the uses of sleep in politics, and some of the representations of sleep in, in literature. I'm very happy to be able to welcome uh, Professor Russell Foster, who's the Chair of Circadian Neuroscience and Chair of the Nuffield Laboratory of Ophthalmology at the University of, of Oxford. Uh, he's a Fellow of the Royal Society, has been since 2008, was elected for his work on uh, circadian cycles, and he's a Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. So, no pressure, but this should be pretty good. <laughs> Russell Foster. So, let's kick off uh, with an overview of, 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 of sleep and clocks. And the first thing I want to emphasise is that entire, in terms of our entire life activities, so you know, the entire activities across our, 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 our life, 36% of our life will be spent asleep. 36%, which means if you live to be 90, then 32 years will have been spent asleep. Now, that's an incredible, that's a prodigious amount of time apparently doing nothing. And it's remarkable when you compare it to all of the other lifetime activities. Work-related is 16%. Um, watching TV is 11%. Household work, 8%. I have to say, in my household, I don't think anything near 8% gets done. It's, it's particularly when the kids are home. Um, but the point I want to try and make is, is that this is the single most important behaviour that we experience. And of course, part of the theme of this evening is that this is a, a behaviour that completely dominates our lives and yet we take it for granted and, and largely ignore it. OK, it's a, a, an absolutely obvious statement to make, but the transition from the wake state to the sleep state is also profound. It's, it's, it's the biggest switch in neural systems, in metabolic systems, in everything you can think of, going, going in one direction and then right over to the other. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but what's going on during sleep is turning out to be incredibly interesting. So information processing in the brain, memory consolidation, tissue repair, metabolic, rebuilding of metabolic pathways, energy repla uh, replacement, the clearance of toxins that build up during the wake state are then prepared, packaged, and then seem to be um, uh, 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 detoxified, ready for voiding during activity the next day. One of the really exciting areas of neuroscience is that if you want to come up with innovative solutions to complex problems, then it's now very clear that a night of sleep can hugely enhance the brain's capability of doing that. So we really need to take sleep, sleep uh, very seriously. OK, let's now consider the role of the eye. We said that the eye plays an absolutely critical role in setting the clock and then the whole of this system to the external world. So the eye is critical. And it's exposure to the light-dark cycle, which is so important. Now let me emphasise, here's the eye detecting the light-dark cycle, going to that master clock within the brain. And what we see here is a cartoon. And each line represents a day. And the wake-sleep cycle is nicely consolidated. It's entrained. Now if you have no eye you've lost your eyes as a result of some ghastly accident, then your ability to regulate your clock is gone. You will spend the rest of your life getting up later and later and later and later. You can no longer coordinate to the external world. So the eye is obviously critically important in this re resetting process. And I spent the last 20 years trying to understand how the eye regulates the clock. So if we have a bit of a closer look at the eye, this is hopefully familiar to many of you. These are the photoreceptor cells, the rods, giving us our sense of dim light vision, the cones, our sense of colour. And this is the inner retina, doing the first stage of visual processing, before a signal is generated in these ganglion cells, they send their projections via their axons, form the optic nerve, off into the brain. Now what turned out to be 
truly extraordinary, and I'm afraid I'm now summarizing 20 years of work in 30 seconds, <laughs> is that we discovered that you can lose all of your classical visual cells, your rods and cones. You've got no sense of light detection whatsoever. And yet, if you're exposed to a light-dark cycle, you can still regulate your clock perfectly well. What we discovered is that there's another class of light sensor photoreceptor within the eye, and it's based upon about one out of every hundred of those ganglion cells that form the optic nerve, nerve is directly light sensitive using a blue light sensitive pigment. And we call these the photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Oh, I'll just show you what they look like. Aren't they beautiful? There's one. And all the little fibers are directly light sensitive. And if we look at a sort of a, an arc of the eye, here's individual cell bodies, and they form this sort of photosensitive net that essentially captures light, brightness from the environment, and sends that off into the brain and the biological clock, setting it to local time. Big clinical implications about all of this, of course, because what it means is that visual blindness need not result in loss of all light detection by the eye. However, sleep and 24-hour rhythms are ignored in clinical ophthalmology. Simply hasn't got there yet. I am fortunate enough to work in Oxford, and my colleagues in the Oxford Eye Hospital, notably Susie Downs, uh, and we're working together, uh, there's quite a big team of us now, asking the question, what is the impact of eye disease on humans and their sleep-wake biology? And I just want to illustrate some of the importance of the data that's emerging. There are patients, of course, with genetic diseases whereby the visual cells are gone, or largely gone. And... Um, they have no visual responses at all. And yet, their photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are there, and they're working, but nobody's bothered to look for that. And so under these circumstances, of course, what the ophthalmologist needs to say is, get out there, expose your eyes to sufficient daytime light, even though you're blind, so that you can set the clock to the external world. Otherwise, you'll drift endlessly through time. It gets even worse, because there's a tendency to say, well... Um, your eyes look a bit odd. They're not really very attractive. Why don't you just pop some dark glasses over them so the rest of us don't have to sort of watch all this? Now, frequently, you know, there are good reasons why you wear dark glasses, but a lot of the time it's aesthetic. And it gets even worse than that because there has and there still is a tendency to say, well, you know, your eyes are no good to you. You're blind. Um, they're a source of infection. You can't see to look after them. Why don't we just pop them out and pop one of these in um, and then, of course, completely unwittingly, what you've done is they're already blind, they've got no sense of space, but then you've taken away their sense of time as well. And this is completely ignored. In the same way, there are individuals whose light sensors are okay, but the inner retina breaks down. So there's no way that the rods and cones can talk to the brain, and you've lost those photosensitive ganglion cells. But again, all is not lost because there are ways of using drugs to try and hit the clock, to consolidate it, to restore a sense of internal time. So the point I'm trying to make is that clinical ophthalmology must now understand that the eye not only provides us with our sense of space, but also with our sense of time. And here's a great example of where a basic science discovery, and it's a very simple question, how does the eye regulate the clock, is transforming the lives of potentially half a, half a billion people worldwide. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to welcome Impropera, who is the world's only improvising uh, opera company. So what we will do is we will uh, perform uh, an event on the spot, a, a, a sleep opera. Uh, we've never done this before. We may never do it again. It depends how it goes. Um, and what we thought we would do is we would enter the dream world of, of, of sleep, where illogical things seem to logically fit together which is a pretty good description of the work we do anyway, but we thought we would post-justify by wrapping it in a sleep context. So, for that, we will need some suggestions. So, for example, could you give us um, a, a name of a person who might, who might have an opera written about them? Anyway. Felix. Felix is correct. Felix. <laughs> could we have a place in the world? Bombay. It's correct, it is indeed Bombay. <laughs> Could we have from this side of the room <laughs> a phrase that you wouldn't necessarily expect to hear in an opera? Eat your broccoli. Uh, thank you, pardon me. I like that accent. 
And the action wins, but I couldn't hear what you said. Eat your broccoli. Eat your broccoli is correct. <laughs> Welcome back. From R Russell's talk um, and, and from the, the, the opera, we learned that there's a downside to not getting enough sleep. And we learned that we're living in this crazy 24-7 society, which is driven by schedules and driven by uh, stimulants and not driven by concern for how we spend 36% uh, of our lives and how we deal with the quality of that large proportion of our lives. And if we... Uh, think about the cognitive costs of not getting uh, those that, that aspects of our lives uh, correct. Think about whether you might be 
uh, working uh, as, as a shift worker in an airport, checking uh, the, the, the scans of, of equipment and, and luggage, or whether you're a radiographer or whether you're just a burnt out person working at your desk. Uh, what we know, and this is work from Tara Santhi, who's here in the, the audience tonight, is that after one night of sleep, you're going to, lack of sleep, you're going to make lots and lots and lots of errors, and that gets worse with subsequent nights of sleep. And we know that lo loss of sleep, we know that not sleeping is a bad thing. What I want to concentrate on is the positive side. What does sleep do that's actually good for you? And it makes you smarter. I'll be showing you that it can make you thinner and that you can live longer and, um, and have a happier life. Let's have a look at what happens during the night. This is one night of sleep across uh, here. And what you do is you go through different phases of sleep during the, uh, the, the night's sleep. In between each of these red bars is roughly about 90 minutes. And you have periods of deep sleep uh, and you have periods of rapid eye movement sleep. And so your brain just doesn't switch off. Your brain is doing something. Russell said about 80% of your brain is, is working um, uh, while you're asleep. Let's look at how the brain can help to make you more smart. Here's something that we like to do in, uh, in laboratories, give people something called paired associate learning tasks. So I show you a picture of an aeroplane and a basketball, that's the pair that you associate. I show you a picture of uh, corn and a dinosaur, that's the pair you associate. I later on give you a test and I'll show you a picture of the basketball and then two pictures of the corn and the aeroplane and you have to say which is the object that's associated with the first. Another kind of test that we like to give people is a test which requires no memory, no association, but just tracing, a complete motor, uh, motor task. Mirror tracing, um, uh, looking in a mirror and tracing something that's in front of you. It's a motor skill. So what happens when we give people these things to learn and then we let them sleep? How does sleep help you to learn these things? What you can see here is that if we have people sleeping early uh, in the evening after learning these two tasks and then we wake them up and, and ask them to, uh, to perform them. People perform very much better if they've slept in the early part of the night on the paired associate learning task. If you want people to improve on the motor task but not the paired associate uh, learning task then you let them sleep in the late phase of the night. So the brain, these phases of sleep are associated with completely different cognitive functions. It's not just an off switch mush in which the same thing is going on uh, all the time. These later phases associated with what we call procedural memory or motor functions and these earlier phases uh, concerned with what we usually think of as clever stuff like learning uh, languages and, and, and facts. How do we improve our lifespan? One of the uh, issues that, um, or one of the long list of issues uh, that Russell brought up was the effect of poor sleep on uh, on lots of aspects of health, and he also had on one of his slides cardiovascular illness. So let's ask, can we have a positive side to that? Does looking after your sleep cycle and your sleep behaviour uh, help you to improve your, um, uh, your uh, health and protection from cardiovascular disease and coronary, uh, uh, coronary disease? So there was a huge study of Greek nappers, um, uh, over 23,000 people, they followed them for over six years. The question of the, of the research was, who dies from coronary heart disease? It's a fun game. <laughs> um, um, and um, what they did was uh, try to control for all sorts of things like uh, level of income, uh, exercise taken, uh, uh, diet. It really is a very, very good study. Uh, these things are hard to do. But what they found was that the occasional nappers had a 12% lower mortality than baseline than the people who didn't nap uh, at all. And the regular nappers had a 37% lower mortality uh, than the, the non-nappers, uh, which is really significant. I mean, it does, I mean, it screws up your G GDP, obviously. <laughs> These are not prosperous people. <laughs> uh, and they're, they're, they're in for, a, as you'll see in a second, they're in for a hell of a pension crisis. Um, here's my favourite, favourite sentence I think it's one sentence, from the whole of that paper. Very, very instructive. Amongst men, the NAP benefit was stronger when the analysis was restricted to those who were currently working at enrolment. You can see there are reasons that might be the case. Whereas among women, a similar analysis was not possible because of the small number of deaths. <laughs> Greek women who NAP are immortal. <laughs> They're amazing, it's so good. Especially that first talk, it was so brilliant, yeah. It's reinforced the importance of sleep. 
that's actually the first opera I've ever seen, so I don't know how true that is to like real opera, but it was, yeah, it's really good, really interesting.